Ladies and gentlemen, we might make a start for this evening. What a full house. It's really fantastic. I can see one spare seat, so, or maybe two. Um, what a great way to kick off 2019. It's really fantastic to see you here. I'd like to begin tonight by acknowledging the Turrbal and Jagera people, the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and extend that to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people here tonight. Tonight is a, is a, a bit of a showstopper, I reckon. Um, we have a number of distinguished people in the guests, a number of distinguished people in the room. I'd like to acknowledge Mr. Casper Cooper, Captain Casper Cooper, Honorary Consul, the Consulate General of the Netherlands in Brisbane, Mr. Maurice Schwartz, Executive Chair, Schwartz Media, and also responsible for the influential publications, the monthly, the quarterly essay, the Saturday paper, as well as the publication that we're launching here tonight, or issue five of that publication, Australia Foreign Affairs. Welcome, Maury. And also Mr. Jonathan Perlman, the editor of Australia Foreign Affairs, and you'll see him a little bit later on the stage this evening. So welcome to our first seminar for 2019. This is the beginning of our 15th year of partnership, a partnership between the Griffith Asia Institute, Griffith University, the Australian Centre for Asia Pacific Art, the Queensland Art Gallery, and the Queensland Gallery of Modern Art to explore issues of contemporary culture, politics and society in our region, while also fostering public discussion of issues of significance for Australia thinking about its place in the region. Over the course of the past 15 years, we have been very privileged to work with the team here at the gallery to host a diverse range of speakers on a whole range of topics, uh, looking at Australia's relationship in particular with its Asian neighbourhood. And tonight in particular is quite special because we're here and of course APT, the Asia Pacific Triennial is on number nine. Uh, which is close to 30 years of engaging with the Asia-Pacific region. So many of you turned up tonight or signed up for tonight's event because you were coming to hear Linda Jiven, uh, the wonderful novelist, essayist, translator and cultural commentator, to speak. And she was going to speak really to her essay that's in this issue of Australian Foreign Affairs. Unfortunately, Linda can't be with us tonight, and I don't think she would mind me saying that she did have a fall and she's had surgery today, unexpected. Um, so we have actually decided to go ahead, not with Linda, but with the next best thing, her understudy, <laughs> Professor Sue Travaskas. So Professor Sue Travaskas, many of you will know anyway. She researches Chinese, Chinese criminal justice, governance and law. Um, she is a wonderful researcher. She is deeply knowledgeable about Chinese politics, China's domestic system and criminal justice in China. She is a very dear friend of the Griffith Asia Institute. I knew she was coming tonight anyway, so she was the first person I called this morning when we heard that Linda wouldn't be here. Not only that, she's also a very good friend and a dear friend of Linda Jiven. So I think if there is anyone to speak to Linda's voice, it will be Sue. So thank you, Sue. So tonight you will actually hear Linda's words coming from Sue. And I have to say, I've never been so prepared as to have a speech completely ready that in the event of accident I could pass it on. I'm really amazed by Linda's capacity to have done that. Um, so you will actually hear Linda's words coming from Sue. And then we thought actually we would take the opportunity to have a conversation with Jonathan uh, about this issue, the current issue of Australian foreign affairs. It is for sale outside. If you haven't got a copy, do have a look at it on your way out and buy one. Um, it's a really good read. And I think the authors, David Walker, George Megalogenis, Linda Jiven, Sarah Teo, uh, are the stars, but there are many others. Um, and it will make for a really interesting read. So before I hand over to Sue, um, let me quickly just give you a date claimer. And although I don't know that I have the date for March, March 28th, our next Perspectives Asia will be as Mangoro Market Merry, Women Guardians of the Mangroves in Papua New Guinea. And that seminar will be presented by Barbara Masake-Liri, 
and Barbara is the Papua New Guinea Country Director for the Nature Conservancy, and she will be joined by Robin James, Director of, the, of Conservation Melanesia from the Nature Conservancy. Um, so put that in your diaries now, and I hope we'll see you then. I'd like to, before I sit down, say a big thank you to Yering Station, our, spon our drink sponsor this evening, and also to the GAI team, if I haven't had a chance to do that, and to the gallery team for the, just the fantastic work um, that actually makes this happen. So without further ado, Professor Sue Travaskas. <laughs> You're going to have to imagine me as a red-headed, vivacious, American-accented Australian, Linda. <laughs> so these are Linda's words, word for word. Thank you. I acknowledge the terrible people as the traditional owners of the land where we gather today. I pay my respect to elders past and present and to emerging community leaders. I also extend respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. I, now Linda, I'm going to remind you halfway through, I am Linda, okay, um, red hair. I was at a dinner party recently where I was seated next to a champion mansplainer. He was a businessman who'd spent a fair bit of time in Shanghai. Upon hearing that I wrote books and essays about China and did literary and film translation from Chinese, he spent much of the evening explaining China to me. <laughs> my partner, Linda, my partner who is Spanish, takes great exception to the term mansplainer. In, but in this case, because the man in question also devoted some time telling him all about Spain, my partner <laughs> asked, can one man ex mansplain to another? <laughs> Among the many, many things that this man told me about the country I have been studying and visiting and writing about for over the last 40 years was the fact that Chinese was a baby language. He elaborated, unlike English, which is layered and elusive, the Chinese language is basic and one-dimensional with a far more limited vocabulary. Mind you, he readily admitted he didn't actually speak more than the basic survival Chinese and couldn't read it, but who would want to bother learning it properly given its shallow simplicity? <laughs> he also found Chinese art, music, society, people, and even food quite unappealing. Also, I think he complained that Chinese millennials spent too much time on their phones and aren't wedded to their jobs. I say, I think he did because by that time I had slipped into a coma. <laughs> there are so many kinds of stupid in this and I could spend the rest of today's talk woman-splaining uh, why men like that should listen to their partners when they hint that maybe someone else might like to talk. But my point is, besides noting that if you sit next to a writer at a dinner party, even a lady writer, you might want to watch what you say. Anyhow, my point is that in some ways this man is only truly exceptional in his insistence that not even Chinese food has much merit to speak of. He may have been on the extreme of disengagement with China, yet I'm quite sure that more people than would admit it out loud find Chinese culture, the culture of the People's Republic of China in particular, confronting confounding, even impenetrable. But before we consider whether Chinese culture can conquer the world, or even, as I ask more modestly in my essay, if it is necessary for us to engage with it at all, we have to define what Chinese culture is. Chinese culture is many things. It's Peking opera and Beijing punk. It is ancient classics and internet slang. It can be historical, retro, contemporary, highbrow, popular, propagandist, or rebellious, and may originate on the mainland or in Taiwan, Hong Kong, or the Chinese diaspora. In fact, not even those geographic categories are hard and fast, with Taiwan stars appearing in mainland movies and other kinds of cultural cross-fertilization increasingly common. 
Like China itself, Chinese culture is a multiverse, a realm of coexisting and intersecting universes. Looking at it another way, there is an official Chinese culture directly overseen by the propaganda department of the People's, of the Communist Party Central Committee, of politically on message cinema, literature and theatre, uplifting revolutionary tunes and so on. And then there's everything else. However you define it, Chinese culture is a window into the heterogeneous intellectual and political preoccupations, hopes, dreams, social realities and fault lines within the nation to which our future is so inextricably tied. Whether or not it is capable of conquering the world, why would you even, why wouldn't you want to look through that window? There are many different ways to engage with Chinese culture. One is as an artist. Some of Australia's finest artists, past and present, have found inspiration in China. An obvious example is the painter Ian Fairweather, who studied the Chinese language and calligraphy in China in the 1920s and 30s. Chinese aesthetics deeply influenced his work. Today, he is considered one of Australia's greatest ever artists. A number of contemporary Australian writers, musicians, theatre makers and visual artists have been to China for festivals, tours or cultural exchanges. It's the visual arts, perhaps, and also perhaps most naturally where, culture, where cultural engagement with China is most fruitful and energised. The fact that language is far less of a barrier plays a significant role. Fairweather went deep and profited greatly. But you can also see cultural cross-fertilisation in the work of artists like Tim Johnson, whose visual language incorporates Chinese influences among many others. Australian arts have benefited tremendously from Chinese immigration, whether that is of earlier generations or current. The great Lindy Lee, who was born here in Brisbane, of course, explores her Chinese roots in her art, as does Hong Kong-born Australian artist John Young. A Xian, Guan Wei and Shen Xiaomin, Tian Li Zhu and Xiao Lu. Meanwhile, are uh, among the exceptional artistic talents who migrated here in the wake of Tiananmen. Others have come since. It's impossible these days to imagine Australia's visual art scene without them. Can I remind you, Linda, red hair, American accent? Okay, I, I talk more in my essay about this kind of cultural engagement, that of Australian artists, including writers and others, with Chinese culture. But here I'd like to focus on the problem of a more general engagement with Chinese culture. As I've said, I think that my dinner companion gave, albeit extreme expression, to a more general sentiment, that engagement with Chinese culture is all too hard. I begin my essay with an example of the recent performance in Melbourne by the National Ballet of China of the song and dance spectacular, The Red Detachment of Women. This is a ballet that tells the story of a young peasant woman who is saved from the clutches of despotic landowner by the communist Red Army. She joins the army and helps to defeat and kill her abuser. The detachment of women is based on a true story but its simplistic division of people into heroes and villains and its uncomplicated theme of revenge and class warfare is pure propaganda. It's one of the prime entertainments of the decade-long ultra-violent cultural revolution. It's a historical artefact and interesting as such. Some Chinese residents of Melbourne, including those whose families had suffered during the communist land reform movement or cultural revolution, however, saw it as a celebration of torture and murder and protested outside the Melbourne Arts Centre on opening night. The ballet's kitschy aesthetic misled some critics into reading ironic intent into the performance, but others didn't know what to think. One, writing in the Daily Review, astutely likened the experience to that of the musical Springtime for Hitler in Mel Brooks, The Producers. While the Red Detachment of Women hardly represents the range of Chinese culture, 
Its reception here illustrates the truth that art can't conquer the world by force. The Chinese party state can and does make its citizens watch shows or movies like this or its contemporary equivalents. We have a choice. And many of us will understandably choose Book of Mormons or Muriel's Wedding. <laughs> Add to this anxiety about Chinese influence and interference in Australia's politics and outrage at such things as continued arrests and harassment of civil society activists, feminists and rights lawyers, it's not hard to feel that culture in service of party and state carries a risk of moral taint. China's official soft power initiatives generally do little to allay our fears and may only increase our confusion. In the spirit of, if I have to live with this earworm, then so do you, I'm going to share with you a minute and a bit of one of the soft power videos that I write about in my essay in Australian Foreign Affairs. The video appeared on the fifth anniversary of the Belt and Road Initiative, by which China is effectively restructuring global econom economics, trade and geopolitics to its own advantage. And I have to add, why wouldn't it, given that the current global order was written to advantage the United States and European Union? I like to build a world, a road, and furnish it with love. Grow apple trees and honey bits and snow white turtle doves. I like to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony. If that video and red detachment of women represent Chinese culture, the answer to the question, as China rises, can its culture conquer the world, is no. <laughs> Unless you define conquer in a Genghis Khan, reduce their cities to ash and rubble and leave their women weeping sort of way. Thankfully, they don't represent Chinese culture any more than the image of Tony Abbott in Speedos represents Australian beach culture. That is to say, Kinda, sorta, yeah, nah, no. <laughs> Here, let me help get that song out of your head or you'll be cursing me for weeks to come. The video I'm going to play you next is of a song by the popular indie band, Karsik Cars, performing one of their biggest hits, Drung Nan Hai. Drung Nan Hai is the name of the leadership compound in Beijing, China's Kremlin, as it were located in the west of the Forbidden City. And even more forbidden, it's also the name of popular, a popular brand of cigarettes. I want to say, uh oh. <laughs> then they go on to say, in other words, when I smoke, I only smoke Drung Nan Hai. These are the words of the song. A few lines and a few more hypnotic repetitions of Drung Nan Hai, and later they sing, Shang Huo Li Bukai Drung Nan Hai, which basically means Drung Nan Hai is an inseparable part, inseparable part of life, or my lifestyle, inseparable, it's inseparable to my lifestyle. It's a bit ambiguous. 
there, then they follow a whole lot more repetitions of Jung Nan Hai, and then they ask, who smoked my Jung Nan Hai? I'm just going to play you the first 30 seconds so you get an idea of the song. So what's that all about? Cigarettes, politics, living in a world where nothing you do puts you out of reach of the Communist Party? I don't have the answer. I don't know the band personally and I have no special insights, but I suspect that at, a very, at the very least it can be understood as an example of tai bian chiu, or a term that's used in ping pong to describe when someone hits a ball that grazes the edge of the table, which means it's technically in, but then spins so crazily that it's almost impossible for their opponents to hit back. After all, this is the same band that has a song called Guan Chang, which means square, as in Tenement Square, and has lines including, this is a square without hope. The young people who once ran around the square these days have already lost their faith. If you enjoyed the car sick cars more than I'd like to build the world a road, it's, it's that just, is that just an aesthetic judgment? What if the content were reversed and the daggy group of young people were singing Jung Nan Hai and the car sick cars chanting the praises of the Belt and Road Initiative? How much of your response is conditioned by your political attitudes? In times when China is a subject of anxiety, uncertainty, and even fear, there's a tendency to embrace dissident narratives. Consider the global popularity of Ai Weiwei, for example. There's nothing wrong with this, it's just that it's useful to be aware of it. Historically, when it's our own society and politics that are responsible for our anxieties, uncertainties, and fears, we tend to idealize China. Voltaire, unhappy with the French institutions of his day, including the Catholic Church, imagined China to be a model of secular humane civilization. The beat poets were rebelling against the oppressive conservatism, conservatism and conformity of 1950s America. They embraced the legendary Chinese hermit poet and free spirit Han Shan, who they called Cold Mountain. The Australian communist and journalist Wilfred Burchett, meanwhile, similarly bristled at the social and political conservatism of the uh, Menzies era. He asserted that in Mao's China, a new life designed to eliminate every tiniest injustice was being built. These were moments when, to some, it really did seem like Chinese culture could conquer the world, or at least a particular interpretation or part of it. It's not all about China, obviously. Like the US, Another big power prone to exceptionalism, China tends to inspire either love or hate. It's important to be alert to how much our own preoccupations, ideological and otherwise, colour our views of China. This is not to say that we shouldn't be concerned about issues like human rights abuses in Xinjiang, for example, but to leap from that to say to hating China is, in my opinion, lazy and even dangerous thinking and just as useless as uncritically loving China. It's much more useful and rewarding to get to know China, to understand it as a complex and heterogeneous place, full of contradictions. Its culture reflects this. Censorship and self-censorship are undeniably among the forces that shape Chinese cultural landscape and affect its power of attraction. The red detachment of women won't conquer the world, but I wonder whether Ai Weiwei already has. China, as I said, is a multiverse. Chinese culture is in fact many cultures. Folk, pop, classical, local, national, official, underground, mainstream, indie, gay, straight, middle class, working class, online, on stage, and so on and so on. If you found that the Belt and Road video charming, well, I'm sure you'll find 
a number of Chinese people who agree. If you found it daggy and unintentionally hilarious, you could also find a number of Chinese people who agree. If you like the car sick cars, well, so do a lot of young Chinese people. And if you didn't, well, there are plenty who didn't as well. That my dinner companion was able to write off the whole thing, country, people, food, culture, says volumes more about him than about China. If you ignore China or just close your eyes, it doesn't go away. If you don't bother taking some time to try to understand it in all its fascinating complexity, you may well be bamboozled by official propaganda that claims all Chinese believe the same things and think in one mind. Are we Asian yet? Asks this edition of Australian Foreign Affairs. It's a difficult question to answer. That's partly because no one really knows quite what Asian means, including most Asians. But Australia is already part of the Chinese world and China is part of Australia's world. China's actions and policies may have direct consequences for our regional security, economic prosperity, universities, environment, food security and political integrity. Australia has 1.2 million residents and, and citizens who claim some form of Chinese ancestry. Mandarin is now the second most common spoken language in Australia. Cultural engagement enriches us, us intellectually, socially and culturally. It doesn't mean we buy the narrative, it means we can read the narrative. It won't in itself solve Australia's economic or political problems with the PRC, some of which are confounding and serious. It will give us some of the tools we need to deal with them. It also makes less likely the kind of racism and facile name calling and stereotyping that can be that can sabotage our ability to interact and negotiate with a country that looks set to dominate geopolitics in our region for some time to come. Besides, and this is a very important point, to equate cultural engagement with political surrender implicitly endorses the idea that Chinese culture is the preserve of the Communist Party and denies that Chinese people themselves that complexity, agency and creativity. Thank you. I think you're getting more and more red-headed by the minute, Sue. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about the accent. Uh, now, <laughs> I, I am going to... I don't think it's fair for us to quiz Sue as if she were the author. Um, however, I think there are some really nice themes to draw out mm. from Linda's piece. Mm. Before we get to that, though, mm. and I hope I'm not stretching mm. the friendship, mm. but you did tell me about a... a you, you gave me some insight into your history with Linda that would have meant she would have been quite pleased to have seen you standing at the podium. And I thought, do if you, you don't mind, mind <laughs> I do. Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> when, when Caitlin asked me this morning, could I play Linda, I, I laughed and I explained why I laughed. It was because um, Linda and I were both living in China. I was working in the embassy in 1988-89 in, in and Linda happened to be there and we were friends and we, all, we got caught up in the... Tiananmen massacre. So we had to get out of the country really quickly and good old uh, Qantas saved the day. We got on a Qantas flight and um, at some stage we were talking about how dramatic, there was a lot of, there's a big story behind all this and it was a very dramatic couple of days to get us onto that flight and we were, we were musing about um, whether or not we should make a movie of it and, um, and Linda said to me, uh, knowing that I'm a classic introvert, she said, um, oh, and who would play you, Sue? And I said, this is the 1980s. And I said, Madonna, of course. <laughs> and so I was thinking today, oh, I bet Linda would be very happy to know that this <laughs> classic introvert Madonna is playing, playing her. her tonight. Yes, and you did it admirably too. Thank you again. <laughs> Thank you. That no, was no a really worries. brilliant no reading. Worries. Yes, yeah. why not? <laughs> Um, the piece actually finished really on this point of getting mm. to know China mm. and this idea of engagement, which is so powerful when you think about the Asia-Pacific Triennial and what sits behind that in terms of our own engagement through visual arts with the, the region we're in. Mm. In her essay, Linda makes the point, a simplistic reading of China, Chinese culture leads to simplistic conclusions. Mm and yet at the same time is talking about a China that is impenetrable, mm. that is a multiverse, many things, and has both the underground and an overlay of the official. Mm. 
Given your expertise and your experience in China, you know, how do we get to know China better? Good question. Maybe come to university and do my <laughs> course on Chinese culture uh -huh. and, and society. But actually, I will give mm. you an example of my course because the first day I do, I do my course on contemporary Chinese society and culture, I, I say to the students, look, in all seriousness, did you know that Shanghai people, um, they, they can't be trusted? And did you know that northern Chinese people, the northeastern Chinese people, they're quite, I have to tell you, they're quite, they can be quite violent and they're very strong-headed people. And, um, and I go on and on and on mm. about this and, and the students are gobsmacked. And I said, these are the kinds of stereotypes, not that whiteies talk mm. to about Chinese, they're, they're the kinds of stereotypes that Chinese themselves apply to other Chinese people. Okay, and if those who have been to China know what I mean when I say Dongbei Ren, you know, they're, they're feisty. Okay, <laughs> so these are stereotypes. So I start with this idea that, mm. that no matter what you're talking about, you've just got to listen to the voice in your, in your head talking about other people. And that mm. if you start from there, then you can start to listen to the way that other people talk about other people and the way that you're talking about Chinese and the way that they're talking about you. Mm. Mm. Fantastic. And nice... Uh, plug there for the course so make sure you look into it everyone Griffith University hashtag um, thank you again uh, Sue for that insight Jonathan I wonder if I can come to you um, firstly congratulations on Australian foreign affairs um, this is issue number five so that must mean it's been going for about 12 months just over 12 just months. over 12 three months. times a year yeah. um, and you know the all of the issues are incredibly thought-provoking my one my personal favorite was the first and the Indonesia uh, which I, I'd like to ask you some questions about it if we have time <laughs> um, but I think what you're doing through this journal is making foreign policy and the kind of discussions that we have around foreign policy very accessible which uh, you know we desperately need in Australia. In terms of this particular issue and the question you're asking, are we Asian yet, history versus geography, can you tell us a little bit about your thinking in putting that question out there and then how you curated the pieces that sat within it? Yeah, sure. Well, thanks very much for that and um, it's great to be here. Thanks for, thanks for having us. Um, yeah, I mean, the question of Australia's relationship with Asia and where it sits with Asia, and obviously that's, that's driving what the gallery is doing at the moment, it's driving what, what your institute does. Um, it's a crucial question for Australia, and one of the interesting things about Australia is that it's not an obvious... Um, there's, no, there's no obvious answer to, to the question, are we Asian, um, and also to just how where Australia sits in its relationship with Asia. Um, you know, the subtitle of the, the, um, the issue is geog geography versus history. Um, and, and those are two of the, I think, main factors that you need to think about when you look at this question because the geography is um, kind of obvious. We're sitting just mm. on the outskirts of Asia, but that itself creates both... Uh, questions about Australia's relationship with Asia, but also great opportunity, as we've seen in recent decades. Um, and then history has put us in this peculiar situation where we're a culturally Western country, sitting far away from the centres of, of Western power. Um, so it's, it's a crucial question, and I think, um, uh, you know, just to, just to draw one Parallel, if you think about it, another country undergoing these sorts of questions is Britain, trying to work out whether it's European. Um, you know, we're not the only country with this sort of mm. identity crisis. Um, but it's, 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 it's a crucial question to look at for Australia, and it's also a fascinating time to look at it because, um, because we are moving, um, I think, you know, we've been moving in the last 10, 20 years, and we sort of th the starting point in my head for this question is, is Paul Keating really raising this debate in the early 90s. If you look at what's happened to Australia since then, um, you know, the demographic changes are quite remarkable. More than 50% of, um, of our new, well over 50% of our new migrants today are coming from Asia. So the face of this country is changing. Um, we, we just look very different to the way we did when Paul Keating asked that question. Um, this trade as well has completely 
changed. Most of our top 15 trading partners now are from Asia. So these things are pulling us in in a direction that makes it look like we're going to answer yes to that question. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, um, you know, there's there's our um, obviously there's our, our language barrier, but um, the the history of Australia is, is still pulling us in a very different direction. Our key security alliance is still with um, with the US, mm -hmm. so we're still um, uh, we're still torn. I think between between the West and um, and our role in Asia, and uh, I mean I would say that the other the other kind of interesting dynamic that's affecting this now is is what's happening with the US and China, um, the growing rivalry that we're seeing, mm. and the declining influence of of the US um, in Asia is really affecting this mm. question, and it's um, it's kind of taking out the allure of what it means to be a Western little outpost in, in Asia. Um, so that's, that's the background. Um, and and that's, that's the question that, that we were trying to ask in this issue. Um, but it, you know, it raises, um, I mean, I guess just from an you know, editor's point of view and just trying to, to, um, trying to look at um, questions that we can ask in the publication, um, it throws up some fascinating questions. You know, Linda's piece is, is brilliant and uh, and, and I think, um, you know, as, as you heard tonight, I mean, it throws up questions about how do we relate to a country like China, which we've, you know, Australia's never had a relationship with, it, with a country like this before. We've always had um, a, a kind of first Britain and then the US as this sort of main ally and mother country almost that we, that we related to, um, where we had very strong cultural, cultural ties to it. We now have... A growing China is, you know, plays a crucial role um, in in Australia, particularly obviously its economy. And yet, uh, you know, it's it's kind of the cause for all this sort of hysteria mm. and misunderstanding. So Linda really, I think, addresses mm. that. Um, I'll run quickly maybe through the the other pieces in the issue. Um, well, actually, before you do, yep. I'm going to ask you some questions about each of them because sure. I think. Um, You've just told us, uh, you, you've just given me a really nice segue, so I want to use it. And that's around this idea of anxiety and the anxiety that we seem to be seeing playing out in the media at the moment is not unfamiliar in Australian narratives about Asia. And David Walker starts the issue off talking about that. And many of you probably have read David's book, Anxious Nation, you know, and he really traverses that narrative and the development of the narrative beautifully. Mm. What I thought was really interesting in this piece was that he also talked about a sense of optimism pre-Federation, you know, a sense of optimism about the region um, that is, we, we often forget, it, it probably wasn't a dominant voice at all, but it was really interesting that he drew on some of these particular players, um, both pre and just post-Federation, that had a, a sense of opportunity about the region. I wonder if you can speak to that kind of narrative as yeah, well. Yeah, look, I found that fascinating mm. in David's piece as well. And um, it made me realise how much my um, perception of Australian history is shaped by the white Australia policy. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, you know, probably I'm not the only one. But so much of the way I think about the way Australia views Asia is shaped by its white Australia policy. And yet, actually, if you go back to the very origins of the colony and the first white people who were here, there was this great debate, not that different to the debate we're having tonight, um, about how do we relate to Asia? And in fact, um, you know, and I'm, 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 I'm sorry to have kind of maligned colonial Australia, but I just assumed that they were all kind of xenophobes. Thinking the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and actually, you know, there was this whole debate going on and there were people there who were saying, well, actually, our future is in Asia and, um, and we, we'd be much better off um, completely tying ourselves to Asia, bringing in Asian migrants who are going to do much better here. Now, they had some wacky 19th century reasons for, for thinking about that. Some of, them, some, of these, um, some of the people advocating it thought that, you know, kind of Asian people would do much better on this part of the world, kind of toiling the land and, and uh, you know, would, would do much better with a country like Australia than white people who couldn't handle the sun. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, this, this debate and this anxiety actually goes back to the, you know, is, 
it's really like well predates Paul Keating and well predates mm. the white Australian policy. It's something that's been part of Australian <coughs> history from, you know, from invasion or um, colonialism. Mm. And so through kind of grappling with that issue of is, is there opportunity or is, it, is, it, is there an outside or alien Asia we need to be very anxious about, um, we've also gone through our own process of kind of imagining and reimagining what Asia is to us. So whether it's... Uh, through regional institutions like APEC or uh, Gareth Evans' East Asian Hemisphere or Kevin Rudd's Asia-Pacific Community or today we talk about the Indo-Pacific and this strategic narrative. Um, and that's a continuous theme. David Walker talks about it, but uh, as do the others. As, as you're sort of looking at these different essays, how helpful or unhelpful is it that we sort of go through this process of trying to create our own strategic narrative about the region? Um, I mean, I think, I, I think the, the, um, the essays in this, in this issue um, kind of make... show the, the, um, the need for Australia to be less paternalistic when it goes about doing that. Mm. Um, and uh, so... You know that was obviously a criticism of the the Asia Pacific community, and um, um, you know Rudd's kind of idea for some sort of EU style Asian um, community forum was never that well defined. But um, you know Sarah Teo in her piece, she's, she's based in Singapore. You know, looks at how I mean there are still criticisms of um, of Australia and the way uh, that was handled. Um, the fact that that Australia didn't consult first, um, um, you know, and, 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 and made all sorts of diplomatic faux pas. So um, I think, you know, what I, what I learned from that, I mean, I'm, I'm, there are so many regional groupings mm. and, um, you know, I'm personally quite sceptical about what they all achieve and I think some countries tend to overvalue their importance. Um, but I think, I think they've been useful for Australia. I think particularly mm. APEC has been useful for Australia. Um, but I also think that the way Australia has approached some of these groupings has reflected perhaps some of the misunderstandings mm. which, which come out even of, of Linda's essay. And domestic politics drives a lot of that discussion as well. George Megalogenis talks about uh, the circus of politics, in fact, um, and in his essay, and I think it's a fair point actually, talking about leaders that haven't don't get to spend a great deal of time as political leaders, don't necessarily have the expertise or the uh, nuance, I suppose, to deal with the region that they're in. Mm. And it, it, Howard showed us that that was learned over time. Um, what are your thoughts on that? And, and, you know, are we ever going to get out of this, this kind of circus where asylum seekers, boat people, stop the boats, is at the centre of that discussion? Well, I hope so. Yeah. Um, I think, um, look, uh, yeah, Julie Bishop has announced she's quitting today and, mm -hmm. and, um, and I think she's an interesting place to start with that conversation because she um, actually managed to stay foreign minister um, throughout the recent changes of leadership and I think that's really been to Australia's benefit. She's developed some close relations. Um, I think she has... Uh, you know, she has sort of learnt on the job. Uh, so, I mean, I, you know, George in his piece argues that, um, that this churn of political leaders has really been to the detriment of Australia and Australian foreign policy. Gives mm. the example of Howard, who made some, some great blunders in his first couple of years, but grew into a sort of elder statesman. Um, and whether, you, whether or not you agree with his foreign policy, he was able to... Um, uh, you know, to, to, to kind of handle the Indonesia relationship really well in the aftermath of Timor. He, um, he, he was also able to um, try to kind of um, manage relationships between China and the US at the beginning of the, the, the kind of rivalry becoming obvious. Mm. Um, so uh, I, I think, you know, I think George's, George's point is, is, um, is right and I, you know... I, I hope things will change, but mm. um, you know, I mean, he makes the point that he, he sort of one of the reasons 
George says that this churn has been happening is because of the type of people that are going to Canberra now. Um, and he makes two points about the type of people that are going to Canberra. One is that, um, that so many of them don't have careers or real-world experience when they go into politics. He's, Tony Abbott was the first Liberal staffer then to, to become Prime Minister. Um, and Canberra now, you know, Parliament House is now filled with MPs who... Who don't have a, you know who don't have a lot of real world experience, um, and that's uh, that's unfortunate. He also makes the point that Parliament House does not reflect Australian society, mm. um, and and that's just abundantly obvious if you walk into uh, mm. to either chamber of Parliament, and uh, and that's something that's that's got to change as well. So mm. you know um, both you know gender diversity but ethnic diversity. Um, are just not represented in Australia. And I think that is... Um, certainly, as that changes, and hopefully it will, I think it will, it will hopefully make Australian politics be more anchored, but it will also hopefully affect some of the issues around how we view the region. It's, really, it's a question of leadership in so many ways, isn't it? And we were very fortunate, some of you may have been here, to host Marty Natalagawa, Indonesia's former uh, foreign minister to deliver our Asia lecture last year. He made a brilliant point and said, you know, in a world where we have so many leaders, we have a real deficit of leadership. <coughs> and, you know, seeing how leadership might be able to better reflect the society we're in would be a really nice uh, change for yep. Australia. I'm going to check with Natasha. How are we going for time? So, we have a few minutes um, for questions from the audience. It's more of a discussion, um, so feel free if you've got a comment to make or a question to generate discussion. We've got one straight away up the back, um, one just here on the side, and another on the side. Two questions. Two questions. OK, I'm sorry. <laughs> Natasha is the boss, so <laughs> we will listen. I've got a very loud voice. Oh, you do? So yeah, you I probably need don't need that at all, but we <laughs> better use it. Jonathan, you mentioned something about the history of Australian discussion of Asia, and uh, I'd, I'd agree with you. I mean, we don't... Uh, uh, I've just got a couple of brief points. We don't discuss Asia or China at the, at the level of Australian society very much. It's all elite discussion. The Austra constitutionally, the Australian Parliament doesn't even have the responsibility for the oversight of foreign uh, affairs. Recently, we had a whole lot of by-elections. Nobody dis discussed what it meant to be an Australian, and yet at the heart of that was the eligibility to sit in the Australian Parliament. Hmm. So I would argue with you that, in fact, we really need to generate this debate away from the, uh, the elites and uh, back amongst the, uh, the community. And historically, there have been some very good debates. China Speaks, written by C.J. Dennis in 1937, was a response to the Japanese invasion of China, which Australia colluded with the United States with the League of Nations uh, charter after uh, the First World War to give the German possessions in China to our allies, the Japanese. Mm. We've got a lot to discuss, but we really need to do it at a grassroots level. Yeah, I, I mean, I'd say, I completely agree. I, I would just say that um, I, do, I, I do think it's, you know, having a more representative um, political class, I think, would also help that discussion. We did have one more question down. Hello. Oh, sorry, we've got one more question. Mm. Hi. Uh, James Fowley, I'm a Griffith University student and uh, one of the New Colombo Plan scholars going to the region um, this year. Uh, just had a question for Jonathan. You mentioned, um, you know, the, the debate that we've had for probably the last 50 years about, you know, Australia's place, are we an Asian nation, are we a Western nation? I guess my question to you is, why do we have to choose? It appears to me, um, you know, Australia has just signed a number of free trade agreements most recently um, we've ratified the TPP without the US. Um, we're going to do something with Indonesia. We do a number of military exercises in Asia. We, do, we have Singaporean military bases in Queensland. What benefit will it be for us to choose and what will that look like if we choose either way? Um, yeah, I, I don't think we have to choose. I think it's a question for, that, for Australia. And I think asking the question um, raises fascinating 
um, kind of challenges about the kind of the kind of nation that we are and the kind of nation that we want to be. Um, but I, I definitely don't think we have to choose. I think one one interesting thing that comes out of um, Sarah Teo's essay is she really kind of divides up. She, she's looking from Asia at sort of how does Asia view Australia and whether it's an Asian country. And I do think, you know, she divides it up into kind of looking at uh, Australia's role in, in regional groupings and then um, kind of culture, you know, culturally. And if, if you start to, um, if you start to divide it up in that way, again, it's, it's not about making a choice, but it just poses really interesting questions about Australia and where it sits. So, um, you know, actually, Australia, if you just look at Asian regional groupings, Australia is becoming an Asian country. Um, it's becoming more and more affiliated with Asian groupings. But if you look at, at culturally, um, you know, I would argue that, that um, we're still closer to the West. You know, again, um, uh, I think, um, uh, you know, until Linda doesn't need to read, write a piece like that, um, uh, which I think she does, you know, and until we reach a p point where um, some of these anxieties have been allayed, then I think you have to say that we're still kind of, um, uh, we're still sort of rooted culturally in the West. So um, it's not about, I, I don't think it's ultimately about um, deciding whether, whether our, whether, you know, you or I are Asian or Western. I think it's about um, kind of, posing questions about Australia and how we, how we relate to this region that we're in. James, can I ask, where are you going with New Colombo Plan? Uh, I travel from Vietnam and then I'm going to Australia. Fantastic. Mm. Congratulations. Yeah. Well done. Mm. That's, uh, you know, a great example of how <coughs> we can encourage more engagement. Um, I was really interested, before we close, to read Miriam Kozik's review of Asia-Pacific Triennial in the February edition of The Monthly, I think, in which uh, she talks about the triennial, the APT as being essential, uh, I'm, I'm going to muck the words up, but something along the lines of this is essential training for any officer of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Um, let's hope they read that. Uh, let's hope that goes into the, soft, the outcomes of the soft power review and let's hope even more people uh, come and just spend time absorbing what is in the gallery, particularly this installation, because it's such a, an interesting representation of artistic practice from across the region. Um, this morning, none of us thought we would be sitting here uh, in front of you, and I'd particularly like to thank Sue and uh, Jonathan for you know, really jumping into the hot seats. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great.